Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our lecture series of Shangchung. And we're very happy today to welcome Gregory Forbes, who's the director of research at Sadra Foundation. Uh, we're very happy to hear about the uh, tale of Gessar tonight, which is a um, very important central, uh, culturally speaking, it's really pivotal to Tibetan culture throughout the Tibetan world. So we're very happy to have you tonight. And the talk will last about an hour and we'll have some questions at the end. So if you want to write your questions in the chat or just keep them for the end for Gregory, uh, you're all welcome. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Gregory, and welcome. Thank you, Jamyong. I'm going to share my screen. So let's hope it's gonna work. Is that okay? Can you see my my slide just to make sure it's working? Yeah, we see you. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'd like to thank you very much, Jamyong and Shangshung Institute, for having me tonight. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to say as well, thank you all for, for joining uh, this, this talk about Gesar. Um, it's very special to me actually being here at Chungshung Institute because I have been a, a student of a I'm kind of a Rinpoche for years too. And um, you know, Rinpoche had a lot of interest in protectors. So I'd like to have a thought for, for him before starting, you know, thought about him. And and the thought for my other uh, teacher too, Zung Sak Gensei um, They've been very inspirational in my journey to you know, explore the world of Gesar. Uh, there's a lot, uh, as some of you know, uh, Namke Nobu Rinpoche was very much into, you know, this, um, this, uh, this side of the Tibetan culture. Uh, he wrote amazing books about that. So I said one later probably about this if we have to have time. I'd like to thank Sadra as well, who always supported me in doing my research. We've been working on different projects. Uh, this is more of a personal project, but a uh, big thanks to uh, Sadra too for, for being here and supporting all this uh, work. Now, um, maybe a word on, on Sreya and how I got involved in this, you know, and, and that's a bit of a, a more personal uh, note, but to explain the journey to uh, my own, you know, where, who I am and why, why I'm speaking about this, um, this evening, you know, which is a very special topic, very vast. So a lot of humility uh, on my part. I'm sure that we won't be able to cover as much as you would like uh, this evening, because this is, uh, as we, we will see, this is a very vast world, very vast world that encompasses all aspects almost of Tibetan culture from pre-Buddhist you know, um, uh, religion or religious systems or or Buddha Dharma together with as well, you know, the history of Tibet, so a lot of different aspects. Um, and so today is gonna be just maybe a glimpse at that. So I started when I was um, writing, uh, well, about, I was about to write my MA thesis at Vienna University and had tried to avoid tantric, tantric lectures or lectures about, you know, classes about, about tantras for various reasons. So I was focusing more on scholastic stuff, uh, Bitama, Madhyamaka, um, Pramana, Sutsema, the logic, and yeah, bar, more boring stuff, I guess, in a way. But then I had the last class to take, and, and I don't know if some of you had the good fortune to, to have met him, but then I had this lecture, very interesting lecture about um, protectors with Geza Betlan Falvi from Hungary was specialized in this topic. And so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take this class. He asked us to choose a text among, among various uh, liturgies about protectors that he had gathered uh, you know, in time. So as he was doing research in Mongolia uh, for most, the most part of them. And I chose to go with Gesar because as the saying goes with Gesar, nothing can go wrong. So I didn't want to go into, you know, say Kajati practices or whatever. And I went, I opted for Gesar. And, and this is the first, my, that was my first encounter with the Gesar ritual, this um, Gesar. So this kind of Gesar Gyalpo. So this like, you know, liturgy about, about Gesar from Mongolia. So I working on this, I ended up doing this uh, emetesis that, that keep, kept growing and growing. I couldn't get out of it. Um, then I was I was invited to give a talk at the Collège de France when Matthew Capstein uh, basically had this conference 
to honor, uh, you know, uh, Holstein, one of the main researchers. And, and so that gave me the occasion to work on, on the king of the Vajra life and this very particular tradition, and as well to identify the genealogy, the transmission line of this uh, very uh, particular teaching. And I have two books coming on that uh, in the coming month. So it's been a bit of a, I don't know, it's been a project I've been working on for now 12 years about that. And I looked at a variety of uh, texts there. So basically a catalog of 106 guest art texts. I had to stop things somewhere because, you know, there are still a lot of guest art liturgies being written as we speak now, probably. And then uh, I put a, a line, you know, I drew a line after Mipam. So I went up to Mipam Rinpoche, and then after that, didn't check. So middle of the 19th century, um, you know, when it was born, was um, until beginning of the 20th century was basically the last time period I considered. So we have about 106 Gesar religious texts, you would say, because there are various aspects there I'm going to talk about in a minute. And quite a few, of course, being uh, related to uh, Mipam. So I translated um, all the oldest layer of this, basically, and, and did some research. So this evening, the, the journey I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, inviting you to <laughs> be part of is going to go through three different uh, worlds and layers as well of, uh, of guess or, you know, developments in, in Tibet, basically the epic, so the story, the rituals that are more, you know, um, rituals of propitiation of, of, of Gesar as a protector here. And then um, basically the Vajrayana practices. So and the Dorje Tsegel, so the, the king of the Vajra life tradition I'm going to talk about, that the Rime movement basically, you know, um, developed is part of these Vajrayana practices. So we're going to start first with the epic, with the story. Um, I don't, I don't think generally we can do a poll, right? But I, I, I don't know if, if everyone is familiar with the guest star, you know, narrative. I'm just going to go fast, a bit fast through the whole story because it's not really our topic uh, tonight. But, but say it'd be lovely to I'd be. I mean, it'd be great to know how many people are actually very familiar with it. Uh, you know, I, I would assume that not everyone is. So maybe if you are, please bear with me. It's just going to be, you know, a short recap. But for those of us who are not, so we have this basically um, story that is uh, found in in this area, so in Mongolia, essentially, and around Mongolia, so Central Asia, and then Tibet and the Himalayan regions such as Ladakh, uh, Sikkim, Nepal. So here we have various languages in which this story is told. It's, it's, it started as an oral tradition, most probably. I'm not going to go into details because it's a huge world in itself. But we have as well written, basically, versions of this, um, of this epic in various languages. So Tibetan, Mongolian, Mongol, Turkic, Kalmuk, Boryat, Kalsa, Tuvan, Chinese, Balti, uh, Bushaski, Lepcha. So various like, like languages from, you know, including some areas in Pakistan as well, Northern Pakistan at the border with, with Ladakh. And, and these early manuscripts that we could find about this story actually go back to the 14th uh, century, so quite early. Well, the earliest xenograph, so prints from, from woodblocks, are basically um, originate from China, from Beijing. And, and were produced in, at the beginning of the 18th century, so much later. Now, the guests are chronicles or, or stories are sung by bots in Tibet traditionally, and they've been like, for some of these versions, put into writing uh, in the course of time. Now, this, they have this unique feature of being still, you know, uh, a textual environment that keeps growing. They're not like finished yet. And before talking about some, some funny aspects of these current developments, actually, that, were, that are quite fun, I'd like to say a word maybe about just when I'm saying story, what am I talking about? Well, four group is essentially of, you know, um, of, of, of narratives. So the first one is songs that can be quite short, not necessarily very long. 
So they're sung by bards, or they're part, part of what we would call the fol folklore, you know, the basically cultural uh, background, particularly in Eastern Tibet. Uh, we have as well short stories or episodes, so more developed stories where we have something going on a bit like, and we can think of it almost like a, a TV show, you know, with various episodes, as you will see. So we have short stories that would be an episode. If you think as a, the structure of a, of a, a four season of a TV show, then you would have basically a season, a song would be, you know, one episode and the short stories would be a whole season, say. Then we have a long narrative works. Long narrative works are, are you know, these, um, these full stories that include several seasons, so several of these short stories put together as chapters. And then we have vast collections of texts, like the one that was published uh, um, over a time period going from 1979 to 1984 in Bhutan, that, that is 31 volume long, so quite, quite long. So what are these episodes um, about? So we have a core, I'm not, I'm just going to talk about the core of the story uh, to introduce, you know, the background for the rituals, because actually the epic, the story is quite important to understand what's going on in, in the rituals. So we have Gesar, that is at that stage, just a being. So guests are here in the heavens and a celestial being surrounded by his family and friends who are gods. And at that moment, the land of Ling is under pressure because of threats, you know, that demons surrounding it are, are basically, you know, creating. So pressuring the land of Ling that is identified by Avalokiteshvara and Padmasambhava has the future Dharma land in Tibet. So very important land, uh, that country that has to be protected. So you can see here the figure of Gurumpache, Padmasambhava. And so the first episode is about this whole like um, setup that, that Gurumpache tries to prepare to save Ling. So he goes to the heaven, convince one of the, god, of the gods to dis descend, literally descend, another impor important uh, notion so this descent of the god. So the descent of Tupagao, who is who will be Gesar uh, on earth. So and there's a lot of stories here. It's very funny. I mean, because um, as we will see throughout the epic, uh, Palma Sambhava is, is, is tricky. There's a lot of like ruses going on in the epic. And so uh, for, as a mother, for example, for 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 the future Gesar, a uh, Guru Rinpoche, uh, basically tricked the Nagas into providing a princess, a Naga princess, and she will be Gesar's mother. So Gesar, and that's already the complication here, has three different families. So he's born finally in Ling, surrounded by several, you know, um, the northern country, Hormon and Jan, so where demons live. And at this stage, so his father is one of the chiefs of, of Ling. Uh, that's his, his earthly father. His actual godly father is Brahma. So he has the th three different families. The third being the local mountain god, Gezo, that is basically a pre-Buddhist mountain god, and that is his spiritual father on earth. So the local Nyan, the local fierce deity, uh, to which you know the community belong in a way and around which they're surrounded. So we have this like various levels of reality already here, right? So there's a lot. To, there's a lot to say about just this episode. Unfortunately, I, I, we won't have time. But the, the Tupaga, you know, as a god, so future Gesar is very reluctant, very reluctant to join Ling. So finally, he's born here. So Gogmo, the Naga princess, is his mother. Sanglin is the chief of of Ling, and at, for a few years, he's basically exiled. His father, Sanglin. Funnily enough, he vanishes. He's not. He's out of the picture very quickly. So he's along with his mother, and his uncle Trotu is someone who is greedy, who wants all the power for himself, and tries to eliminate physically um, the future Gesar, who at this stage is called Juru. So I'm sorry if it's confusing, but you have already these various levels of you know identity going on in the epic, and we'll see how it's used as well in the Vajrayana rituals. So finally, after a, lo a lot of tricks and displaying magic, because he's a god actually, Gesar manages to 
uh, give a dream. And there's there's a lot of, again, like here, funny episodes because he looks like a ratchet, you know, boy, but he's actually very smart. He outsmarts his uncle all the time. He's better at magic. And finally, at some point when he thinks that uh, the time has come, he tricks his uncle to arrange a horse race to decide who is going to be the future uh, king of, of Ling. And so here he, he, he has a horse that is, of course, a god as well, as he was basically still in the heavens. He demanded from Gorin Boche and from the other gods to be accompanied by his brothers, celestial brothers on earth to give him more power and to help him in his task of saving Ling. So what you have here is basically Gesa on his horse, who is a deity too, and having tricked Trotun into organizing this race, of course, Gesa wins uh, the race. And at this point, there is yet another transfiguration in a way, you know, transformation of Gesa, who manifests in his full majesty and, and glory as a warrior, as a fierce warrior, the best of, of warriors. So you have this already in the story, this interplay between magic and, and power, right? It's not just about Gesa, the warrior, the king, and it's more complex than that. Magic, tricking, you know, your adversaries through illusion or illusory, you know, um, uh, well, threats, for example, is, is part of the game. After that, in most of the uh, versions of the Gesar epic, we have four, the four demon kings and then, of course, the battles uh, against them and, and Gesar's victory every time. So there again, a lot to be said. There are lots of like um, dark aspects as well there. So it's not all rosy and the, the you know, Gesar is sometimes uh, quite um, extreme in what he, he, he sees, he does from an external perspective, I guess, if you're not part of the tradition. So you could see things as, think, as, as pretty brutal at times. So, but there's always this aspect as well of, of tricking the demons, you know. An important thing, I, I say a word about that um, uh, later. Um, the thing is here that Gesser is very human in his fight. He, there is, there are, I mean, there are like, uh, you know, failures, basically sometimes. He loses his wife at some point to another demon when he was fighting another one and then forgot to come back. So, you know, got totally infatuated by his victory, intoxicated by it to the point where he forgot his own, like, duty as the king of Ling. So you have a lot of aspects like this that make Gesser very human in a way. And then you have other episodes that are not really found in every single version of the epic. So we're talking about all together, according to the researcher Yan and Hong, about one million, you know, words. So a huge epic, you know, in very in many different versions. So the storyline is more or less the same, but you don't have all the episodes in each version of the story. So you have some other episodes like this one. You have an episode as well that is about how Gessar goes into uh, the underworld to rescue his mother that has been very much uh, Buddhistized in a way. So a lot of Buddhist, you know, um, well, notions, teachings that have been embedded into the story in the course of time, particularly under the, um, the 19th century, the Rime, the Rime tradition. And so here, these episodes never stop to grow. So for you have even an episode, I think, of Gessar, how Gessar defeated Germany and Hitler, you know, during the Second World War. So you have a constant product, production of new stories, new ideas. For those of us who are really interesting to, interested to know more, then there are, I, I would recommend maybe just four, four books, you know, for, for, this, um, for this, this story and to discover a little bit more about it and to know, you know, to get a feeling about what the culture is about. We have the epic, so of Guess of Ling, which is about the birth and, and then the taming and the race. So the very the first two episodes are really important. And then the taming of the demons, so the stories. And then there is a book that's quite good too, with a lot of illustrations about Gessar and the world of Gessar. So his family and, and the Dradas, the, we'll see the war deities accompanying him. And then we have the full story I had been translated already for some time by Alexandra Davinel and Lama Youngden about the entire, uh, basically, uh, epic. So here, to sum up, really, and, and to use maybe 
aspects of the story that are important for us to understand why we ended up with Vajrayana rituals like the King of the, King of the Vajra life, the Dorje Tsegya. Then we have the fact that, you know, I mean, the few points in this story, the ruse, ruse the control of illusion, basically, is key. And, and playing with trance states, like basically controlling the life force, you know, relation to what the life force is, is basically all based on controlling illusion. So this is something that, you know, is very important because it will be used very much in the context of Vajrayana. So now camaraderie too is another important point. Even when, you know, basically Gessar makes fun of Trotong, his uncle, and there's always some kind of tenderness there. It can be tough with his uncle, even when his uncle tries to kill him, but you have this constant feeling that we are all in this together, you know, in this story. And that's a very important thing. And here humor is the key. So there is always a lot of laughing, a lot of distance with what is happening, as if none of this is real. And at the same time, there is, you know, the need to defeat demons, the need to overcome them on this level of, of, of their reality, I guess. So funny persons here in the epic constantly, and even demons sometimes, are anyone who becomes gullible to the point of forgetting that all this is not quite real. You know, so anyone who's stuck on an emotion, basically, is, is bound, you know, and bound and then therefore loses the power loses the life force. And then we'll see a little bit how this um, works now. So we can come back on this if, if uh, some of you are interested in knowing about research has been done on this. It's quite a long history you now of research on Gessar and, um, and the, the Chinese as well have been the past uh, 15, 20 years uh, investing quite a lot actually into the Gessar epic for various uh, reasons. I like to start with the quandary now. I will show you, like, take a dive into this, uh, you know, uh, later rituals, Rime rituals. And here we have a short uh, ritual that has been written by Dokense Yeshidorje, so one of the great figures of the Rime movement, 19th century, Eastern Tibet. And I'd like to read these few lines to, 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 yeah, show you how things have changed from the story, which is a kind of like, you know, popular epic, like a TV show or like a, a Marvel, like think of a Marvel movie or Marvel series. And then this thing now, you know, which is quite different. You know? From the vast expense of Domodatu, our awareness and emptiness, free from mental proliferations, arises the unceasing manifestation of the power of awareness, the deity infinitely pervading the peaceful and wrathful ones, the dancing power of awareness, the best of sentient beings, the Jala. And here I highlighted terms that are already showing that there is a change in you know, the nature of the um, reality we're talking about. Gessar is not just a being. So who or what is Gessar exactly in these Vajrayana practices? And this is what we're going to talk about uh, now. So here, it's interesting to see the collection of, um, of uh, Vajrayana texts, basically on Gessar, particularly uh, if we're interested in the Dolce Tsegya tradition, the king of the Vajra life. Um, I started uh, by looking at the Ling Gessar Gitsu and then, um, which was all we had for a while. And then in 2015, the uh, Chinlap Teza was published, which is a massive 10 volume collection of all available rituals. Um, some of them actually are missing. I, I, I could find a few, but by and large, you have um, everything that um, Tibetan masters have uh, written about um, Gesar. Not everything that's practiced. A lot of practices are oral, or even or not recorded necessarily, or just inspirational in nature. But when we're talking about uh, you know um, this. Uh, written rituals, this collection is very complete. I think there are just for the pre-Mipam rituals, I think maybe four, or five or six texts that are not included in there. So first, um, quickly, uh, we have to see, you know, what happened after, after the epic became popular and how basically 
um, people started practicing Vajrayana rituals, right? And here, there is a kind of intermediary step. So we find in the 17th century, the earliest Gesal text. Supposedly, uh, the second Kamapa, Kamapakshi, would have written um, one of these uh, uh, rituals. Uh, but that's too, that's way too early. And I think actually there is a misattribution here of authorship. I, I think it's actually uh, Karma Chame, uh, Raga Azie, who is the author of that text. So I will, I will be uh, publishing something about that. But if we look at this first uh, phase of uh, rituals, we have rituals by Dechen Dorje, uh, Chame, so uh, Karma Chame, Dredzin Dul Dorje, and then the fifth Ariyama as well. So now I'm losing Getso, right? So we have this first uh, basically text and, and layer of Getso rituals that are essentially about song. So the purification through smoke. And that's with a lot of, of Buddhist content that has been added to this practice that is pre-Buddhist essentially. And this first phase of you know, rituals are very much just about that. So they are all about attracting power, good fortune, having better health, uh, increasing one's life force and prosperity. And so here we have basically terms some like lunta, you know, yong, sok, uh, cha, la, wong tong, all these terms that are used that are typical of this environment and this layer. Now the oldest text is, I will show you in a minute, and it's from the 14th century the oldest uh, text propitiating Gesar that we have in this collection and we can find when checking, for example, BTRC or looking around where there is. So some ritual is, is an offering to the local um, gods. So it is not Buddhist per se, it's practiced by non-Buddhists as well in Tibet. And the feature, the feature of this um, ritual is to purify. It's purified by burning juniper wood among other, other things, but principally mainly juniper wood. And it's like, you know, uh, basically a way to eliminate what is called in, in this cultural, you know, um, world, but it's called jip, like the pollution, a pollution resulting from having done something wrong. Now, this something wrong thing is usually linked to anything that would induce disorder or chaos, or that would basically challenge the order of things. And this could be like anything from very serious crimes, such as, uh, uh, you know, um, killing, so murdering, or, or you know, other uh, things like incest or any kind of like uh, abuse, physical abuse of any kind, basically, to a member of one's community, down to, um, uh, you know, um, polluting sacred places, holy places where God is residing, that the God, a local God has taken as support, or that they, uh, household gods have taken the support, for example, the hearthstone. So selling the hearthstone. And then here, this when this pollution happens, this is basically creating all, all the disorders that will affect the person or the community. We're talking about um, epidemics, talking about war, we're talking about uh, any kind of basically challenge uh, to one's health and well being, mental or physical. That can as well open the door to um, being, you know, uh, subjected to to some types of like malevolent gods um, attacks, basically. So the drip is very important in in this context. Putting a shoe on your head as well, for example, is is something that will create a dip, a pollution. And so it's a very deep. There's a lot to be said, and I'm, I'm feeling a bit bad that we don't have time to go into the whole, like you know, like uh, logic of what the jib is and how it affects the law, the power of the person and the power of the community. But basically this ritual of purifying these pollutions is the Gessar ritual par excellence. So it's really what Gessar performs himself in the epic when propitiating his own protector. So here that's the oldest Gessar ritual. I'm not going to read it, but you see, there is a short invocation and it's a, a burn, by the way, ritual from the 14th century. So we have, it's a non-Buddhist uh, ritual. So we have this burn 
as well, you know, uh, song. So purification here, where the deity is purified from the pollutions that the person or the community or, or, or any other being has created that is basically affecting and sometimes making this deity angry. So here we have the invocation with the purification and here the invocation basically. And from the beginning, there are some very interesting aspects where you see, as I was explaining earlier, the, the boundaries are a bit blurred between the physical wor world and the invisible world. Like, you know, set on your head, the helmet of the sun, put on your body, the great armor on the moon. And so, you know, you find this across all guest rituals, really part of the guest um, uh, world, even in rituals and in Vajrayana practices. And then you have, of course, what is asked, you know? So that's a give and take uh, thing. That's basically true an O for true, you know, people being bound by pledges, basically. And so here you're offering, you're purifying, you're invoking, and you're asking for benefit. And so if the gods are pleased by that, then they will favor you. And that's the logic very much of this um, layer of the, of the ritual. So here we have uh, in this first time, the central figures I, I mentioned, Kama Chame, Dudul Dorje, and, and they are the first group of people that were basically in a non-sectarian, um, you know, that had this non-sectarian approach in a time of, of trouble very much. So let's look at Kamet Chame, and I think is a central person who brought these rituals that were probably, you know, reenactments of what guests were done by, by common people on the basis of a non-Buddhist approach to, to this world, right? So like the village burn, um, uh, Charles Rainbow has, has worked a lot on that if you're interested. So there is basically this first layer where Kamachame and his associates are bringing this into Buddhist practice into you know the world of Buddha Dharma basically. And here it's very short. This is the full ritual. I think it's probably one of the oldest Buddhist uh, song, guest of song, you know. So again, everything will be purified. Here you have Drala. So Drala is what Gesar is, the black-headed people are the Tibetans. And so you have this invocation. And you can see that you have now a lot of like Buddha terminology here. So Buddha will magically manifest in human form. So, you know, and then like this is the demon of horror is very important in the epic. So we're linking up as well with the epic. And, and you have this devotion to here, this expression of, you know, of devotion, <clears throat> purification, homage, and at the same time requests. Uh, requests of the time, I believe, are very much linked as well to things that were uh, reflecting the state, in, you know, in which uh, Kamachame um, was finding himself. So, you know, we are basically at the height of the, um, uh, we're probably around uh, 1730 or 40. And so we are at the height of the, of the uh, sectarian strife between the Giluk and uh, the Giluk path and the Kama path in central Tibet following, you know, uh, the fall of the, of the Tsangpas. And then in, in 1640, the eruption of the Mongols, uh, Kosha Mongols with Kushi Khan as the leader uh, into Tibet. And so basically and destroying then later on the great encampment of, of the Kamapa at the time. So of the 10th Kamapa, Cheng Dorji. And so that's the thing here that we're talking about. That's a kind of time when these Gesar rituals emerge. And I think it's very important because there are two things here that we will keep seeing at important junctures in this tradition, which is non-sectarianism and then trouble times. So Gesar as a Jala is basically, uh, here you have Gesar as a Jala and his uh, own protector, Matin Pomla, that is invoked as well through this uh, song ritual that Gesar performs in the story. Yeah, we have a first mention, you know, I mean, um, of Mipam, I mean, important mention in the King of the Vajra Life. So we're now in the actual sadhana, you know, we have uh, two Veramas and Jalas. And Jalas are very important symbols here. They're used by Mipam and by a lot of masters of that tradition to establish a connection between, you know, this world and, and, and the Vajra life, actually, that uh, Gesar is going to be about. So the Drala is part of the five personal gods originally, and he's residing on the right shoulder of the warrior. 
But in the epic, you have Gessar basically surrounded by, this is Gessar, nine Dralas who are his companions. So Dralas are embodied in a lot of things. They're embodied in, you know, in the person, they're embodied in the people surrounding the person, Gessar being as well, a Jala. And then we even have animals around Gessar that are uh, linked as well to this um, notion, to this identity of Jala of being a war god. So Jala in this fierce appearance of a Nian. And every basically animal here that is as well as support for this Jala, the Uri's Jala, has special qualities, special qualities to help Gessar. So meaning you have a very important link here between the deity called Jala as a war god, this type of, you know, very similar to the mountain god or to the Nian, you know, type of, of being. And that is the expression of qualities. And then of course, you have weapons. And in these weapons, it's a thing you find already in the epic that is very big in the rituals. You find basically these uh, miraculous self-effective weapons that are the support for the drama. And it's very difficult here to say whether they are the drama or whether they are the support. The lines are really blurred. They are, of course, a support. The drama can change support, right? This, you know, uh, war god can move. But at the same time, the, the, the weapon is acting like the body of the, uh, you know, um, of the drama. And the quality and the power, like the sharpness of the blade. So the quality and power of the thing becomes the expression of the drama. And that's a very important poetic thing in, on one level that can be used in various ways in the rituals too. So we have now to link up everything here, we have the drama as a local god, a mountain god basically, who is the support of a community I'm going to be fast. I'm sorry if I'm too fast. If you have questions, please, like we can come back to this. But I, I just realized I don't have much time left. So I'm spinning up a bit. And then we have the invocation in some local non Buddhist communities through Lapa or through uh, Lawan of basically this God that will descend into the spirit medium. That's a big, big thing in this, in this you know, um, areas. We have actually. This possibility in these communities of having a spirit medium that can channel the deity, the god, the local god. And the drama has this quality too. And that's quite important because then, of course, once the drama is taking, you know, the lapa as a support, having descended, so again, this descent of the god, then you can ask questions, you can have divination, you can have as well, you know, various like um, qualities that are embodied in, in the lapa. And that is another very important aspect we find in the Vajra practices. So now, um, maybe just to get to these practices, we have in, in Eastern Tibet, the place where most probably Vajrayana practices um, arose. So we're talking about Nangchen, actually, most probably I'm thinking of Tana Monastery, places as well in Golok are very important in the Gethar. Um, you know, um, well, uh, a Vajra rituals. It's difficult to know exactly precisely the place where it arose. Gesar, if you wonder, was it's difficult even to know whether it was an historical person. It's been, it's been surmised it could have been a local king from the 11th century, actually, that was taken up by the epic as, as a model. But it's very difficult to see the historicity. And even you see, when we're looking at rituals, we went back to the 17th century only. Right, for these traditions when it comes to rituals. Now, for the Dorje Tsegel, the Vajra, the king of the Vajra life, everything happens in actually between Lhasa and, and Lari. And I'm going to just uh, quickly mention this. But before that, you see what is really interesting for us is that we have first the story, then we have all these like rituals that are pre Buddhist essentially. You can even have a magical like a whip. You know, and all these things you find in the text of the Rime tradition of the non-sectarian 19th century tradition of Eastern Tibet. But you find other things too. You find, you know, sadhanas, complete guru yoga type of practices, nintic instructions as well, pith instruction in the form of menak. And so, and in, in initiation, introduction to the protector of the sote, that is like basically very much looking like an empowerment. And so here, what happened? And this is where the 
the king of the Rajalai tradition really, you know, comes uh, into play because everything shifts in in the 18th century. Again, a time of turmoil. Basically, uh, the Dzungka uh, uh, Mongols were at that time in Tibet. So we are right after the time when the Dzungka Mongols were defeated, basically by with the help of the, of of the, the Chinese emperor, you know, the Qing dynasty and local noblemen, Tibetan noblemen. So two years after that, right in a time that was pretty crazy when we had a Tibetan leader called Polane emerging, basically working with the Chinese to, to rule Tibet at that time. So right at that time where you had, you know, um, assassination at the court, execution then later on of, of the culprits, all this emerges a pure vision. And, and a pure vision that Lelong, the fifth Lelong, it's a very important Gelukpa with an Enigma background uh, had. And he was a specialist of, of the occult art and, and Tibetan demonology. He wrote a lot. I think Cameron Bailey actually wrote a very interesting account of his life and, and his main works. So he had three, he had a pure vision, but in three parts free text. So one is, and it, I think it's reflective of the entire development I've been trying to, you know, uh, to uh, to identify here. It's which is first the basically narrative, the story. Then the solche uh, here, but it's basically a song. So the purification through smoke, purifying smoke, and then the menak, and then all the practices. And so in 1729, so an underling in Tibet. So we have this basically vision of Lelum, of Shepe Dolce, so the fifth Lelum, having this whole development mapped in a way. And I think it's no coincidence. That's not a term, it's, it's spoken of as a pure vision. And honestly, the line is probably very thin here. Now you realize that the story and the epic functions almost like in the burn, you know, foundational myth, the mom, the proclamation before ritual of what the story of the story, you know, the whole like thing before you do the ritual. And that's very typical here too, of a non-Buddhist in a way, you know, organization of practice and text. Now the important thing for, for the Dorje Tsegel in a way is, um, is the Terma, very central uh, by a very, very mysterious figure that, it, I mean, I had quite quite some trouble to identify where it is, it's none other than a, uh, basically a Lari uh, family, um, you know, uh, uh, Dama Raja, in a way, was running the estate of his family of the Lagari uh, house. So we are in the, a bit later, a little bit later. We don't know his dates. So probably end of the our second part, I would say, of the 18th century for sure. So Larik Dechen Yesherul Patsel. So very uh, Nigma name, in a way, for, for those of us who, who can read Tibetan. And he starts with this term, uh, having a vision of Gesar in the way Gesar appeared to uh, Shepe Dorje. And this is the text that then everyone in the, then, you know, um, Rime lineage of 19th century and 20th century is going to use as a basis for their own liturgy. And so when you see the famous Mipam Rinpoche's Dorje Tsegel, King of the Vajra Life liturgy, it's basically a rewriting of, a, or an improvisation on the Therma uh, of a Larik. And that's something that is acknowledged by, uh, by Mipam Rinpoche uh, in, in his own like a sadhana. Same thing here with the seventh uh, Chara uh, tool group. Same thing as well with uh, Vigo Kinsey Rinpoche's a recent as well, a more recent version of the text. So then now to go into the text, because we don't have much more time, I think. I'm like, I'm sorry for speeding up. There's so much with, in the guest our world, that's the problem, you know? And I feel always so bad skipping some aspects. Please, like, you know, if you have questions, I, I'll try to answer them. But now really, the last thing maybe, so whoa, to answer our, our question, remember, we had this question, who, if anyone, is the king of the Vajra life? And here we have a threefold space of experience in these uh, rituals. We have the outer level where you have uh, basically patient and agent or subject object that are objectified, they're objects, they're their own thing. Then we have the inner level, like a mindscape more where subject and object are subjectified, they're just expression of mind. 
And then here we have the level of Buddha nature too, right? When basically one eliminates negative emotions, then the demons of negative emotions, then you have on this level the qualities. So all the jhanas, the qualities of Buddha nature manifesting. And then you find the novel level, which is the secret level, but what Foucault would have called the teratopia, you know, the third space. We have basically a start of non-dualism, a state of non-dualism between subject and object. And so the whole Jala symbol is used to, to basically play with these three different levels. So here it's beautiful text by control, but we can come back to it if you, if you wish later, but maybe I, I should just move on to the king of the Vajra life proper. So we have here, I just highlighted the various levels, you know, and you have, look at this, just the first line maybe, the playful expression of the unchanging primordial knowing, hundred moods, the Lord of Jala. So here the Lord of Jala is basically the expressive power of itself, right? The expressive power of, of awareness, Rikpa. And that's the Lord of Jala. So the one imbued with the magic that protects the world, the Lord, the great lion, the king abiding as a multifaceted gem. So here the, the all different aspects of the Jala. And you see, this is a descent there as well a descent that is not necessarily descent anymore of the God as an, an external being on the level of, you know, where things are objectified, but more the descent of your own awareness, basically, to your own reality. And that's what these, um, these things are about. So here you see the representation of Kesar as the king of the Vajra life. Dojelekpa, uh, Yujunma, and Mikmar, his protectors and retinue. And so we are from the Jala, from the Jala, that was the Jala in the song rituals, in the purification rituals, to Gesar in the guise of a magician more. So the magic here is, is really taking over. So now we are in Mipam's king of the Vajra life, the a famous, most fam one of the most famous sadhanas or practice texts on the Vajrayana level this time, uh, composed by Mipam. He composed a lot of important texts like the Solo Chenmo, a great invocation in times of, of turmoil, really, so something very important. But this one is the text that Kesar uh, practitioners use a lot. It's very popular. So as we have seen, there are various versions, but the, others, the other ones were not even known. We didn't know um, where, where this one was coming. It, it took quite a while to, to actually pull the thread. So great hero, subdue of the armies of demons, the enemies, hold of the sword, bow, and arrows of insight. Conqueror of hallucinations, the armies of samsara, by means of mindfulness, when thrown you as the Vajra basic expense, days of a single essence. So you see, you have now something that's happening on these three levels. And, and Mipam, in a very poetic and beautiful way, switches this truth regime or this reality regimes, like, you know, switches. And there's this whole basically thing happening in the practice text that is playing on the cultural background on this notion of what things are on their level of reality when they're taken as objects that exist from their own side, as opposed to be a reflection of your mind, not to mention the expressive power of your own, basically, uh, awareness. And here you have very political, uh, political, you know, formulae that are coming from the epic. The reign of long life, prosperity and joy is falling and falling, sillily, incense clouds of rainbow, Light and nectar, rising, rising, ta -la -la. And all these verbs are like an omatopia or, or, or poetical, you know, reduplications that are used in Tibetan to create this, this effect of presence. This moment is like really, you know, we would say, and the horse is, and you ride the horse, and you ride, and you rise. Like that, you know, and this kind of thing. And so it's creating this kind of like very present thing here. So a recognition, separation first from mind and awareness. And we know what it is like through Roshan exercises, Samzin and Dzogchen. So you can see the eruption of Dzogchen, basically terminology into the king of the Vajra life. It is very heavily loaded with these Dzogchen words, Tsel, Rolpa, you know, all these Rikpa of course. And so after you've had this separation between mind and awareness, so Sam and Rikpa, Namshe Yeshe, then you have, you know, the recognition 
of the place where things are, yeah, like hallucination evaporates. And then the vision, the manifestation of vision through the mere thought of you, make us fulfill without obstructions the activities of pacification, enrichment, subjugation, instruction according to circumstances. And finally, make us accomplish your mind as the body of wisdom that spontaneously arises with Nepronal's basic expanse. And here you have this, you know, um, this final vision of like the elimination essentially of everything that is an obstacle, Shudra is the manifestation, the clearance, you know, obstacle is the manifestation of the nature of reality as it is, but embodied, embodied in its streets, expressive power. And the whole, the whole Saturn of the king of the Vajra life is, is about this. So playing, you know, using basically these um, symbols coming from uh, not necessarily Buddhist layer of culture, of Tibetan culture, and then, you know, introducing basically practitioners to these this very important stages in the practice of that tradition that is very much aimed at realizing the, the, the great perfection. Doctrine. And so the embedding of terminology that corresponds to this. And so it's kind of interplay, constant interplay between, you know, uh, Gesar as a cultural motive symbol and, and the entire world of Gesar, the type of deities, and then what is the actual pointing out instruction when, uh, as far as Dzogchen is, is concerned, and the way to maintain this, this vision, this re recognition. In that sense, so basically, this is the descent of the God on that level. That's the descent of the God, of the Jah basically is the descent of awareness. And the very specific thing here is that um, in the king of the Vajra life tradition, like Gesa doesn't depart. You know, usually in Vajrayana, higher practices at some point, the deity departs. And here uh, in this tradition, Gesa basically camps in the practitioner, resides there, stays there. And so the practitioner becomes the support, but more than that, everything as we have seen, elements, Elements, persons, yeah, communities, things, anything that has a certain quality that makes you think, oh, you know, that brings this moment, this 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 moment is is basically the drala, the world of drala, and that's why dralas are embodied, dralas are present, and this presence is what creates the now, the moment of power, and in this tradition, you're not. Kidnapped. There's a lot of abductions in the story, you know, Gesar. So you're not abducted by thoughts dwelling on the past. You're not kidnapped by thoughts, you know, about the future. And this being in the in the present moment is the the moment of um, of power, of true power. That's the moment of freedom, and that's the moment of majesty without you know fear and hope. And that's the um, what I believe. Um, the king of the Vajra life is trying to to teach us. So thank you. If you have any question. Thank you so much, Greg. That's very interesting to hear so many layers of you know what I personally knew more as a sort of popular epic story. So yeah. fascinating to hear so many different layers. And I think we do have a question in the chat already from Amalia. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a comment or a question. Maybe it's more of a comment, but Amalia. Well, this, is, this is just a comment because you brought up um, Gessar versus uh, the Nazis, which I've yeah. been very lucky to get a copy of. Yeah. Um, and so just, first of all, I want to say your presentation was absolutely spectacular. Loved it. Thank uh, you, learned Amalia. a lot. Um, but yes, in regards to that, that actually falls into a very specific category of Gessar, essentially what we would call in the modern parlance fan fiction, mm -hmm. um, unlike many of the other right. people which are considered canonical. Absolutely. So, yeah. so uh, it's interesting because we have this expansion that is canonical, such as paramas and things from the Jombas. Yeah. And then things that are considered fan fiction, such as this, and of course my personal favorite, which is a radio play of Gessar versus HIV, <laughs> yeah. uh, which 
played as a as a health education throughout Tibet up until at least the mid 2010s. So yeah, that was just a quick comment. But thank you. This presentation. No, thank you so much, Amalia. And I'm so happy you're here because we were together in Mongolia, actually. Remember? Vaguely, yeah, I met we had so this many people. We had this this panel on Gesar in Ulaanbaatar years ago. Oh my gosh, yes, 2013. Oh my gosh. Yes, that's right. And so, so good to, to talk to you again, actually. And you know, <laughs> so exciting to see where you've been going with your research. It's so <laughs> cool. I loved every second of this. <laughs> Thank you. I think there's some other questions such as, is Mipham's King of the Vajra Life published? It's, um, I think there are some translations probably uh, circulating. Uh, I, I'm going to 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 publish basically um, a lot of translations from I mean from from the earliest up to Mipam and there'll be um, um, the King of the Vajra Life and the Solo Chenmo and Mipam's uh, you know uh, most important uh, text uh, as well. So that should be available I think next year at some point. And there's another question if it's possible to find audio versions of Gesser prayer chants. Prayer chants, um, I think so. I think um, you have, um, um, why is it? There's, a, there's a channel by uh, Ling Lamore, right? who, is, who, who is very amazing. I mean, she, she collected a lot of materials there on YouTube and you have like, uh, you have some, even some rituals there that have been filmed and you know, um, one of them is a, is a kind of like practice text that has been translated. There are subtitles. It's very interesting to look at it to get a feel of how it is in Tibet. And unfortunately, we haven't had um, enough time for that. But, you know, Gesar is, 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 is becoming something else, a bit, a bit something else in the West too. You know, the way you start having really a kind of, a, you have communities of practitioners of, of, of the king of the Vajra life. And it started as well with a, Chungpa Rinpoche, right? Chagam Chungpa. So we had a lot, we had a huge tradition here from the Shambhala, for example, um, Sangha too, where for years people have been practicing Gesar. And, and you know, this is, this is interesting because if you look at uh, the way rituals are performed in, in Ando or in, in, in Kam, you know, so, and if you look at the way it is uh, in, in Western countries or in America or Europe, it's it's quite different. There are, there are very similar things, but you know I think the Tibetan approach was was way more about the community than it is in 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 American Europe. You know where it's going to be as well more of a personal practice, where you know if you take this particular text, it's like a sadhana, almost guru yoga, right? It's like a guru yoga basically. I mean in a way it has this this. Um, this, this power and, and it could be practiced as such, as opposed to the original song, like smoke purification offering type of ritual, that would be a community-based, you know, practice in a way. So everyone will join. So you still have that. You have guess our pujas as well in America or in Europe. So there's this thing. But the king of the Vajra life becomes almost one of these Vajrana, you know, practices such as a, a daily guru yoga or something, you know, practitioners would do on a daily basis. Greg, I have a question. I remember yes, watching video many years ago, which I couldn't find on the internet anymore. Something sort of documentary called something like the Salt Man of Tibet or something. And there was this old lady, I don't know if you're familiar with it, where she would, she was an illiterate uh, old nomad yeah. lady who recited by heart and they're sort right. of uh, bards, which even if they're illiterate, they never studied it. It comes spontaneously in these songs. Do you still have... Uh, many cases, many instances of people alive still reciting continuously. Kind of oh, yes, you do. You have a lot of like Jung, you know, the, the whole like, like um, tale aspect recited by bots, basically. Some of them are amazing and can know literally, you know, uh, uh, thousands of lines by heart. And and some of them just, you know, are, are not really, as you were saying, they're not educated, right? I mean, they just at some point had uh, uh, an inspiration. I, I can't say revelation because it's, 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 you know, tell, but they were suddenly inspired or there are like very interesting, various accounts of this, of this uh, phenomenon, you know, where someone who doesn't know to read all of a sudden can recite like, like 
I don't know, like complete episodes of, of Gessar's life. And that's why as well, it's very difficult when we're saying it's the largest epic in the world. It's true because of, of all the variants, right? And, 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 you know, but it's not like it's, it's, um, it's as big as the Mahabharata if you take just the, the core, um, you know, episodes of the, of, of the epic. So I wanted to say this because, yes, it's what is very important. It's that it's so alive as a tradition still today that basically you have a, a corpus, right? You have a, a body of, of, uh, of tales, of episodes that is very large. Sometimes you have the same episode, but it's not quite told in the same way. You have little, little variants, you know, things that happen in different ways. Uh, I think when, for example, uh, Gessar, you know, at some point after having defeated uh, uh, the demon, Lut I think Lutzong, right? Or he's basically forgetting to come back as I was mentioning and and then, you know, cranes come that are sent by his wife, Rumo, in Ling, to, to wake him up. And, and in some episodes that I was, uh, I mean, that some Tibetan friends told me about, he wakes up because, you know, basically one of the cranes defecates and it falls in his mouth. And then it's so bitter that he wakes him up from his trance state, you know, not remembering that it was, oh, wait, I was coming from Ling, I defeated the demon. And I'm stuck that and I have a new wife. Wait, what's happening? So you have this really, you know, very important um, aspects, um, you know, that are totally different ways. And in some other episodes, it's just he sees the crane and then he realizes, oh, wait, that reminds me of my homeland, something, you know. So you have different accounts, you have variants. And then when you take all these together and because of these oral traditions, you know, you have these, these super important passages that are told like in, 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 in very um, sophisticated ways, but but quite quite various actually. Then you end up with with you know, yeah a huge body of text that I think uh, in China a lot of researchers have, have tried to compile basically over the years. Thank you. I see there's another question in the chat from Walker, and he asks, "Can you say a little bit more about how people in this tradition relate to the engagement of Drala when the deity has descended?" Are there specific methods for relating with Drala and experience that are part of these practices? Well, very often in, you know, um, in the world of the, um, in this world, because of the pollution aspect, the drip, and then the purification, it's very important to have a very clean place to invoke Dralas. So Dralas, you know, have to be invoked in places are pristine, really, and very, very clean, very extremely clean. So that's one thing. In the Gesser tradition, I think Chagam Chungpa, you know, was was very adamant that things had to be done the right way. That came across sometimes as weird because, you know, I mean, there was a time when people were were hippies or were not really into, you know, and and then and that's that's a very Gesserian, you know, aspect. Like, you know, for example, the way you dress. So the way you receive the drama is very much linked. The way you hold your body, the way everything you speak, the kind of foreign language you wouldn't use, you know, all these. And so it's a, a very important aspect to be, to be a support. Now, when we're talking about that and in relation to what we, we were you know, trying to um, explore together earlier, we have to see on which level we're, we're talking here, right? I mean, we have different levels. As I was saying, I have one level that is kind of like, uh, yes, there is a God, the God is external as being comes into me. You know, that's one level for Tibetans. I don't think that for um, post postmodern people, it's it's necessarily easy to accept that. So you know that's one aspect. How you deal with that is basically, you know, if you're a lapa, the there is a descent of the god, and then at some point, so usually there is a mirror in which the consciousness of the lapa will dwell as the possession take place. And you have that in the tantra in India with the aveshari as well, the possession basically of the practitioner by by you know, um, a deity in a way, a god or a deity. So here you have this happening. And at, at the end, the deity departs from this perspective. The god, local god will depart. Once the spirit medium, you know, the session is finished. So once the trance stops, it means that the deity is gone. And then, you know, the consciousness from the other support, the mirror usually, then comes back into the body of the spirit medium. So that's one level. Now on the level of the descent of the draw life, you're talking about one's Buddha nature. It's basically, you know, the elimination of negativities, negative and virtuous, you would say, you know, from Buddhist perspective, actions, you know, 
and anything that's basically you know for me pam it's even a, a matter of philosophy because buddha nature is not produced it's always been there but we it's been veiled right like the sun by the clouds so it's been veiled by you know impurities that on that are just you know temporary getting rid of the impurities so defilements negativities and virtuous deeds everything means that you know the sound of buddha nature can shine unimpeded together with all the qualities of that nature basically and that's the other level that's very important and this is why sometimes in the ksr rituals you have this almost feeling that it's you have this naive you know uh, uh positive forces against negative forces it's 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 like you know, in tibetan so it's really like like even tempted as such so you have this fight and and that's on that level very much what it reveals so now mipam theorized this as jeljre in philosophy in his philosophy you know buddha nature is the result of elimination it's not created it's not produced it's revealed and so it's very important because if it were produced it'd be conditioned it'd be temporary it'd be deceiving you know the whole thing so here you have this level on the inner level of your own mind then the rituals play on that very much too and this is where that is the descent of the drama the drama descending is basically you know this elimination taking place and we are more i suppose mahayana level of practice on that on that one right now if you take the secret level so the descent of the drama is you know when i suppose you make you know you using exercises like samzin rushen all this when you make a distinction between conditioned dualistic mind and non-dual you know primordial awareness and so that is the descent of the jala in the ritual and the recognition the permanent recognition of you know at every single moment of that is is the jala camping in you you know <laughs> residing in you so at that moment the whole reality perceived as things objects persons you know groups whatever becomes basically the expressive power of this awareness and so this this is the way you know i guess practitioners will relate with these different identities in, i call them interlaced identities of the jala and so there is a spirit medium level which is not the big thing in the in the tradition to be honest of the king of the vajra life it's a bit like a cultural you know um resource that the remain masters are using to go to the thing that truly matters for them and the thing that truly matters to them you know is actually that that their disciples so people you know who need the help are going to realize this this rikpa this you know awareness this non-dual awareness and that's what the, the the whole ritual is about basically it's helping you know helping the practitioners sustain this and that's the guess are and that's the real thing you know in 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 people thank you thank you very interesting do we have any final questions if we have any questions or otherwise greg if you'd like to wrap up saying anything in particular about... well i don't know if there is a question <laughs> there is well then to wrap it up i i just make this aspiration that we all like you know realize the the vajra life and we we'll all be kings of the Vajra life. That's of queens, you know, of the Vajra life. And that as well doesn't matter, as you know. And so that's my my wish for all of us. Thank you so much for being there. Thank you for coming and thank you everybody for attending.